Good. Recording in progress. Welcome, folks, to today's Hyperledger Supply Chain and Trade Finance Special Interest Group uh, session with Farm to Plate. Well, I'll introduce them in a second here. Uh, so uh, glad you're joining us either here live or if you are uh, watching us on YouTube after the fact. Um, we're part of Hyperledger, so just a little housekeeping kind of stuff. All are welcome. We're glad you're here in either of those two uh, venues here. Uh, and that's good. The other part is please don't share anything that's confidential in nature. This is an open session. Uh, and we don't want anything that you don't want shared, nor do we want any collusion here from an antitrust uh, perspective with things. Uh, let's see here. Uh, some upcoming events in this fall. Alicia, we're going to have to work on some trade finance stuff uh, here to get that we into, are. into the list there. Um, the other thing I want to mention is we should have the first blog. That's our project for this year is doing six blogs. And we'll have the first one out hopefully in the next week or so. And then Alicia is leading the charge on the second one on traceability. And I can't see if uh, uh, and we're going to have one around NFTs and I think one around IoT and then a trade finance one are mm -hmm. topics right now. So if any of those sound interesting to you, please get in touch with one of us uh, via the website, wiki, et cetera, et cetera. And we can plug you in because the more the merrier with that. So, hey, Alicia, you had something you wanted to share? Tom, I was going to say, if you want to show people the page where they can look up more on the topics and see who to get in touch with for each topic, um, uh, that way for people who don't know the, the wiki as well. Complicated for me. So, yes. Sorry. So, link. <laughs> I will take this link and I will put it into the chat here. So that's a good, that's a good way to do that. Okay. So in the chat here is the link where you can see what the topics are, who's leading the charge associated with it. And at least the, the goal for us to do it over the next series of months uh, with things. So thank you, Alicia, for pointing that yeah. out. So today's presentation is from Farm to Plate. As I uh, mentioned, I'll turn it over to them in a second. We have Saptarshi uh, here, Pavan, and we have Suvo who are going to be sharing with us uh, what they've done and how it actually works in a real life situation at Fishmonger. So I always like those kind of things. So that's 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 great. So we're glad that they're here. Subtarshi, so I'll let you, I'll stop sharing and I'll let you start grabbing the uh, sharing your screen. Uh, the other part here is Subtarshi, so would you like questions along the way or do you like questions to be held to the end? Uh, I think we can take the questions. So once we are done, it'll be a short presentation. We'll not drag for long, maybe 15 to 20 minutes. We'll try to wrap up in 20 minutes. So we have fairly long time to cover up for any follow-up questions on any of these slides. Okay, so so let's go through. So I, I would recommend if you have questions along the way, put them in chat and then we can come back to them at the end. And I will not forget about your questions. Thanks, thanks, Tom. So thanks again, Tom, Alicia, and all for joining this call and those who might be listening to it later. So we are Farm to Plate. We graduated from Paramount Software Solutions as the parent company. Our initiative started in 2020 as an in-house product of Paramount. And in 2022, we started our operations from Atlanta in Georgia. And now we have uh, operations and offices uh, almost all around the world. We have operations in Asia, Europe, Africa, as well as in the US for the North American uh, activities in the food supply chain. The core vision of Farm to Plate is actually to enable the small and mid-sized businesses, especially the small businesses who are willing to join the digital revolution who are willing to be part of the digital ecosystem. However, due to uh, limitations on accessibility, due to limitations on affordability, and uh, also due to certain limitations on uh, the knowledge gap, the awareness campaigns which are required are not actually able to connect well or whatever has been done or has been attempted to a great extent seems to be fragmented. 
So we want to make sure that we can help and contribute in the digital revolution to connect the grassroots level players, whether it be the fishermen, farmers, growers, and others, including the small businesses, the suppliers, uh, as well as traders, or even going further into the distribution realm or even in the processing and manufacturing activity, those who have not been able to achieve a substantial scale, however, are willing to join the digital bandwagon to some extent if we can contribute and make some impact in their life. That is the core goal. And we are also covered with a vision of sustainability in the end-to-end -end operations. Luckily, today we have with us our uh, client from Fishmongers, Mr. Subo Sarkar, who is the founding member and the CEO from Fishmongers. And we have had the opportunity to connect and work with them in the Indian subcontinent, in the live fish supply chain. So I'll pass over to Subo to share some glimpse of what he has been doing so far. And then we'll take over a little bit on how farm to plate connected with them and what did we do so far. Over to you, Subo. Thanks, uh, Saptarshi. Uh, hello, everyone, and hello, world. So Hello World is the first program that I have learned as a developer and so from Fishmongers. <laughs> so very happy to be here and thanks for having me. Um, so Fishmongers is a company uh, which is uh, leading uh, the category of live fish directly uh, from farm to the plate. This is a very new concept uh, that we are able to do it with technology. And since we are bringing the fishes in the live condition, uh, we are almost reducing the zero. Globally, 50% of the fishes are wasted uh, due to perishability, and we are almost making it 10 to zero with that. So talking about the India's context from where the fishmongers uh, has been drawn. So India is the second largest aquaculture producer globally, third largest consumer, almost 20.7 million tons of fish uh, produced by aquaculture uh, uh, annually, and that's 15% of the global share. So today we are at a $20 billion economy and aquaculture in India covering three and a half million hectares of land where fishes are farmed, not caught. Over, and we are impacting more than 5 million plus aquaculture farmers, impacting more than 14 million livelihoods. So what we have seen over a period of time, the poultry meat, red meat preferences are getting reduced and people are shifting towards the fish. That's the most easy to digest protein and it's very lean with high omega-3 content. And we have seen the paddy farmers who are growing rice shifting to the fish farming because of the income expansion. And overall, there has been a tremendous policy support from the government after the launch of Blue Revolution 1.0 on 2015, followed by 2.0 on 2020. So almost $4 billion near about has been invested to boost the fishery sector in India. And not only it's the age of India, it's the age of Asia, and everybody is looking forward to that. And advancement of certain technologies that can really transform the yield in aquaculture and uh, bring more traceability and food safety in the aquaculture. Because when we talk about the aquaculture and fish, we are dealing with the dead uh, stuffs or frozen stuffs, so, which is a very big concern where we see a tremendous partnership uh, with Farm to Plate. I'm going to walk you uh, through some few more slides. Shaptashi can help me through to continue the story. Uh, so in India, if you talk about this con context, we are almost consuming 500 lakh kilos of fish when 98% is consumed in the fresh form or chilled form. They are not frozen. Frozen is not preferable in India, not, not only in India, but also in Asia, where more than 70% of global fish is consumed. And live fish is a very small. role and all we know is a fundamental concept that live fish helps realizing premium everywhere not only in india but rest of the world but there are big problems in live fish transportation it's not easy to transport the fish from farm to the plate uh, because uh, there is a lot of mortality issues and a lot of small vendors are trying to do that but they are failing uh, because of the technology gap where fishmong was playing a major role and other thing is that why live fish is required because fresh fish or chilled fish is actually not fresh. I mean, there are harmful treatment of chemicals. We don't know how old is the fish, about its traceability, when it is caught. And a lot of wastage has been there. 25% of the fish are thrown away in Indian landscape. 
even the fish which are not thrown away are not always in a good grade for human consumption. Uh, so overall, uh, we see a tremendous potential to bridge this gap with the technology of live fish, where fishmongers is playing a great role. Um, Saptashi, you can move me to the next slide. And yes, um, after uh, the advent of this technology, now live fish is feasible and viable uh, concept in India. And we are ready to go to the rest of the world. And Farm to Plate has been of a great support to bring the uh, traceability, ideas of traceability tracking. And now we can say that it is the safest fish fishmongers is going to bring. And not only with that, it is going to bring to the uh, plate with uh, if after the impact of all of these sustainable development goals. We are increasing the income more than 200% of the stakeholders because there is a heavy realization of premium from live fish. We are reducing the wastage that acts on the climate, saving the carbon footprint, increasing the responsible consumption and production. And we are getting all the fish from aquaculture. We are not catching the fish from the ocean. That's impacting life below water, life on land. And overall, uh, I mean, uh, of course, uh, zero hunger, no poverty, um, and gender equality is also a part of it because now smaller livelihoods are involved. And uh, we see a massive transformation from paddy to live fish, uh, uh, increase of uh, you know fresh fish into the market, and overall, it's a very big uh, economic boost. So that's the ambition and that's the impact. And I'm really excited uh, to be part of farm to bear platform and Linux Hyperledger in, in empowering or rather powering uh, this kind of solutions. Um, and I think uh, this is it, Saptarshi, for me, I guess. Yes, thanks, Shubo. So All right, guys. Thank you very much. Co-creating here. Uh, the aquaculture practice in India. So instead of uh, dipping into the existing limited uh, fishes, which are in the, that we call the seafood or fishes coming from the oceans, and which leads to a concern on overfishing and limitations of uh, how do we manage on sustainability here, we are co-creating the ecosystem on the uh, terrestrial mode. How do we go for aquaculture practices, growing fishes and increasing the scale of income and opportunities for business. Uh, this is something that Fishmongers has been actively involved and we have had our fair share of contributing to them. So how did we got connected with them is basically they came up with certain interest on offline engagement for the fishermen. There is no access to internet. So the first point which I mentioned on accessibility, we had to look into the offline mode of engaging while promoting digitization and digitalization of the ecosystem. We also had to look into the multilingual aspect because not all of them do speak English or understand English. So it has to be converted into their native language to make it suitable for them. And while going in the technical layer, we made sure that we are compliant with data standards that are prevalent and practiced globally, like the GS1 data standards on certain parameters of KDEs and CTAs. And uh, we are focusing exclusively on the instance level of use or going into the granular details of each and every item so that if someone does a QR code scan, they should be able to trace back to the exact source, not on a lot level, but on an individual item level. And uh, when coming to the operations for any import activity within the US that fishes are being exported to US, or any operation in US, we made sure that we started off from the grassroots level itself with FDA compliance in mind and uh, making sure that our data transactions with our uh, collaborators like fishmongers and others who join the network, we can make it seamless. And rest, I leave upon my colleague uh, Pavan to share and explain a little bit about the solution level architecture of farm to plate Pavan, over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Sadrashi. Thank you, guys. Okay, so all right. Uh, so for the farm to plate, when we are talking, uh, when we are thinking about uh, building a new SaaS product, so there were a lot of challenges, right? So first one, selection of the block uh, blockchain framework that is Hyperledger Fabric. Why we have made the decision? So Hyperledger Fabric is one of the uh, one of the framework which provide a lot of flexibilities to us. First, it is a permission plus private. It provide a modular architecture. So it's a lot of components where we can just choose and have uh, that option. So the third one is the uh, 
developers like we have different kind of frameworks where we can just use right for writing the smart contract writing the api so we can just choose any one of the language and start actually directly development from the first day so we have hyperledger fabric which is uh, i mean latest version were considered uh, considered and uh, it's already deployed on the production as well so it's having different kind of nodes uh, so as per the clients we decide how many nodes and everything we want uh, another one thing when we are talking about the permission plus private network, so only authorized entities are allowed to interact with the network. So that's what the requirement we uh, we get from uh, the clients, where they the only necessary uh, actors who needs to do some kind of certain actions. So we have different kind of layers of the security. First, at the API layer itself, where we do the business logic validations. But before that, uh, we do that uh, permission checks item. I would say like uh, identity and access management. And one more layer at the smart contract as well, we have a data validation. At the two places, uh, this validation is happening. First at the business layer, second one is the blockchain layer. And on the, uh, the full application is deployed under the Kubernetes. So we don't need to worry about the uh, scalabilities and all. So it automatically scale up and scale down uh, uh, up to certain extent, like what configuration we have defined. Another one thing, when, when we're talking about any kind of so solutions, uh, interoperability is one of the uh, major challenge, I would say. So we are using the GS1 standards and that's uh, fulfilling the needs of the customers because we have certain standards, we have to uh, feed the data in certain format and then, uh, the, so farm to plate understand that data format. So there are a lot of businesses uh, who, who follow their own standards, right? Everyone is segregated and it's uh, totally, uh, I mean, it's a totally segregated industry, I would say, and one of the complex uh, domain supply chain. So, so in that case, they can just follow the one, some specific standard or in case someone is already following their own, we can have some sort of a connector between our farm to plate applications and the client and that data can be uh, converted into the GS1 standards. Okay, that's flexibility also we have uh, using the connectors. Uh, so for the front end, we are using React JS, that is the latest version. Again, uh, so for Hyperledger Fabric, we have 2.2. Uh, At that time, it was the LTS version, and we are migrating to the 2.5 as well. So one more uh, important thing I wanted to mention. So this cows DB we are using as a state database, which has various queries capabilities. For analytical purpose, we can just utilize this. And one more thing. It's not something directly uh, fetching data from the block. Uh, this blockchain, it can reduce the performance, right, at the peak time. So in that case, we are storing this data onto the off-chain database as well, where we can just use this data for the analytical queries and show the beautiful dashboards for the business uh, business persons. Uh, on the integration part, so again, there are a lot of already a um, uh, lot of already CRMs available in the industry. So we have to make sure those are uh, interoperable with uh, this farm to plate. We have some of the connector up to certain extent. We are building again with a different kind of uh, uh, like SAP or maybe Oracle. There are a lot of other um, CRMs which we are trying to um, have the capabilities. And anyway, our farm to plate is already using the GS1 standard. So that certain format, we need to just convert it. And that probably some additional uh, small effort we require to just convert that data as a connector. IoT integration is also there. Uh, so where we are capturing the sensors data when we are uh, when we are showing the traceability, right, from source to destination of any kind of uh, fish product, we need to store, uh, store certain parameters using the IoT devices, like temperature is one of them, most important, I would say, because they, they need to, uh, they needs to have some specific temperature range and depending on if it is exceeding more than that, so some alerts will get triggered and we are putting on this data onto the blockchain. So anytime we can just check it. And if some if temperature exceeds some certain le limit, then we can immediately identify it and um, uh, show us the alerts and everything. So, uh, okay, another one thing, the cloud, cloud we are using at the AWS, so everything is deployed on the AWS. So these are the different major uh, technology stacks we are using for API, we have flex, flexible architecture, and right now uh, those are written in the Node.js. On onto the database, we have different type of SQL and NoSQL database. MongoDB is one of them where we are storing the uh, option data, and uh, in some cases we are storing some of the managed uh, managed data like uh, on the SQL databases like PostgreSQL. And yeah, uh, that's it on the architecture. Uh, over to you, Sushil. Thank you.
thanks pavan you covered a lot and uh, yeah the next is the challenges and lessons learned so far in the engagement and exploration of technology implementation for a social cause for a supply chain blended with sustainability and socio-economic inclusion so our first uh, head start was with uh, we tried off with uh, pushing technology first and it didn't go well for us initially we got some you know uh, i would say interesting learnings from that as experiences and uh, we tried to understand and eventually we figured out that market first should be the first motto for us to proceed forward which is market linkage once a market linkage is mapped and there is a credible need from the market where we can really push a type of a technology then we saw there is a great use case for pushing with technologies innovative and emerging technologies like blockchain here in this case i'm referring to hyperledger fabric which we have been practicing for the last almost seven years now so that has been the first uh, piece of uh, obstacle that we had to overcome. Second is on the integration while operating with different clients or different uh, stakeholders, they do have their own infrastructure, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud, and we have to explore. While in the cloud, it becomes comparatively easier. However, if it is on-prem or it has to go through certain levels of compliance, we figured out that the integration in itself is a project. And uh, that is something where we get to learn that we need to come up with some kind of an adapters or some kind of a data translators, which can help us make things easier. And third, but most important we see is the interface, the front end that Pavan was talking, the UI side. When we talk about the people on the grassroots level as end users, is it something that resonates with their values? Is it something that they can understand? So from a user adoption, we see that UI UX here played a key role to make things much easier for them where they can navigate and to present, pitch it in the language that they understand. And even after that, as a backup, we are also going through multiple sessions of awareness across the country uh, once in a month to promote and let them adopt and onboard in the digital journey. So this is something that we have learned and we will be happy for any follow-up thoughts, comments, and questions. Over to Tom. Should I keep it in a sharing mode, Tom? Uh, well, let's see here. Let's just stay right here because we might go okay. back and forth between some of these uh, these uh, charts here. So folks that are online, uh, you're welcome. To, I don't think we had any questions in the chat, but you are welcome to uh, raise your hand or you can st turn yourself off a of mute and go and uh, ask a question. I will ask one question. If you could go back, I think it was chart seven. Um, it, it was the, I think it was the first one that Suho you presented. There was an acronym on there that I did Oops. not know. Let me share. And Jim has posted right several PMM, questions in the chat. PMMSY. I wasn't sure what that acronym was could keep on going back okay okay this is pradhan mantri matsya sampada yojana it's one of the central government policy or scheme which is oh, okay. being availed for moving ahead it is the prime okay. minister's fishery scheme okay gotcha so so basically it's government support here to uh have yes to that. yes okay got it okay and then on the next chart um here i think it was the next chart maybe it was the chart after that uh, you showed the SDGs, yes. So, so United Nations Sustainability Development Goals here. So the question for you, and then I'll stop and let other folks ask questions. Um, you Are you finding that there's more interest from potential users of this because of the SDGs or because of the economic incentives? The economic, in okay. I guess I'll leave it upon Subo if you can answer. And maybe I can add up later. Yeah, so to answer Tom's question, like both are related. <laughs> if you are impacting SDGs, yeah, you are uh, impacting the economy. If you are impacting the economy, you are impacting the SDGs. So, it's, so, it's a, so you talk about both of these things or from your perspective, Suvo, because of SDGs and economic is why you decided to use Farm to Plate. Yeah, absolutely. 
Okay. Good. Okay. Any other questions? Alicia, was there something in chat that I missed? Well, Jim has posted several questions in the chat. Let's go over them one by one. The first question was, what are the supply chain interfaces you use versus build? Uh, can you please uh, rephrase the question? Uh, what um, I'm looking at, yeah, what I'm looking at is your um, network, uh, FTP, has to integrate um, with external um, yes quote, supply chain uh, enterprise software, you know, Sage, Oracle, all kinds of ones, Infor, there's a million of them out there. Um, many of them are in use in, I'll quote, the food supply chain. And the question is, do you have a model on how you go after um, deciding and how you actually implement uh, interfaces to those supply chains since they all don't support the same GS1 standards that you're built on, obviously? So if you are referring to the integration challenge, uh... I would say, Jim, we take it on a multi-pronged approach right now based on the learning that we have had so far. Uh, initially, we used to go on a custom one-on-one -on -one kind of a mapping, a relational mapping with one single custom solution. But we saw that when the solutions with whom we wish to connect, if they are on the cloud, it makes things easier for us. So, I mean, what has been the practice so far is we check, are they on the same cloud native environment? or are there something like the workloads and applications are distributed across? So we do a mapping of the IT landscape of the client environment or the partner on what exact data do we need from them or what kind of a push-pull operations is expected. And again, considering is it going to lead to some kind of a breach or compliance issues? So right now I can say still it is on a pseudo custom mode where we do a mapping as a consultative approach and we proceed ahead. But we see there is a great need and opportunity to come up with some kind of a data adapters uh, where things can help with the faster integration with more visibility, more uh, transparency when it comes to the integration layer of architecture. So let me. So the example would be Fishmonger since they're here. Yes. Yes. Um, they're on some sort of a platform today and you've somehow integrated them into your network. So what was their network? And then the question that you had to integrate with. And then the question is, I'll say, given that you've done that integration, I'm going to guess that you now have what I call <clears throat> uh, an agent type for that specific type of network to integrate with. Maybe I'm going too far on that. Uh, on the architectural side, maybe Pavan will be better positioned to respond. But still, as far as I understand, there are different na nature of transactional integration we do from a track and trace, which is the physical supply chain operation. The Fishmonger is using a particular type of software. They have their own inbuilt uh, capabilities as well, which they do integrating with their physical, uh, you know, patented technology that they have uh, grown in-house. So that is a separate integration than the three transactions that they do for sales analytics, demand forecasting, and other kind of things. So there are different contingents of software for different scope. So accordingly, we take it on a you know, different kind of an activity. We have skipped some of those slides for proprietary and confidentiality. However, maybe Pavan, if you have anything additional to share, feel free to uh, chime in. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so while uh, while talking about the integration, so one of the most uh, uh, mo most faced challenge, actually, I would say it's a different kind of phrases. Maybe they are, they are trying to convey the exactly same, but in a different word. Someone is saying product ID, someone is saying ZTIN, Someone is saying something is product identification. So we have to map those fields. And as per the requirement, like customer probably uh, may have some um, established, uh, established uh, CRMs, or maybe they have they just maybe a very uh, less used CRM, which is not very much common. So in that case, they, they need to get, let us know the data exactly, what exactly data they have. We write some kind of sort of connect connectors like in between. And the data will get transformed to the uh, GS1 standards, what we have right now, and it will get ingested in, uh, to the uh, farm to plate application. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, and there are some common connectors also. We are working like for SAP, Oracle, Microsoft Dynamics, and also there are a lot of uh, other services like inventory management, warehouse management. There are, uh, so we are currently working, and uh, those uh, flexibilities we are uh, trying to provide to the uh, end consumers. Yep. Okay. Thanks. 
Well, let's, let's okay. Continue. So let's continue on this because Jim's got a lot of good questions, including one that I have. Was the next one? What is the payment systems integration? I'm thinking. Okay, if you you're concerned and some people like to factor their their stuff, et cetera, et cetera. So payment systems and trade finance. Where where where's that right now on your on your on your plate? No pun intended. Uh, here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I would like to take this. So for the trade finance related, uh, we are just doing the sales analytics related integration for eventual demand forecasting and others in the push-pull operation in the supply chain. We have not yet ventured into the enablement of the payment that is taken separately because of certain compliances involved. And we want to cover the other areas of the physical operation of the supply chain on the track and trace side before even we venture into the trade related aspect on the commercial management. Okay. Um, adding to Saptashi, so there is one feature actually in our application, back to the society. So if some end consumer is scanning some kind of code, so, uh, so scanning some kind of QR code, so he will get whole journey. And there is option uh, to just tip to the farmer directly. So he can just make some payments like ten dollar, five dollar. It's a small tip to that. It directly just goes to the farmers. So that part we have integrated using Stripe, and that is the payment uh, in, uh, integration we have done uh, for that small part only. But I would like to also add here, just to clarify, this is different than the general B two B transaction. This is for a social cause. You want to tip someone for their good practices or for their sustainability practices, which is directly going to a farmer and the businesses in between do not have anything to do. And uh, that's what we have built. Okay, Jim, is there any other follow-ups to that that you'd like to ask? No, that gives me a pretty good, uh, I'll call it a good starting point for where they are, what they've done so far. And obviously there's always tons more you can do in trade finance, but you know that's an evolution as you grow the network, I'll say, which makes sense. Good. Uh, would you like to go to the next question, Subtarshi, about scaling performance benchmarks? Uh, Can you please, I'm sorry, I didn't hear it properly. Sure. Question right here, what scaling and performance benchmarks, what, what scaling and, I can't read, what scaling okay. and performance benchmarks are you now targeting? What scaling? Okay, great. So right now, our QA architect is working to scale the mobile app. We have two different versions. One is a mobile app. The other is a web app. Mobile app is for the grassroots level farmer, fisherman, and all the ag agro commodity related people. And that we are targeting for 10 million. Population of India is like 1.5 billion. We are not targeting the whole, but we are targeting for 10 million users is what on the mobile app side. On the user side for the web app, we are looking at 10,000 users. So that's something. And so far we have tested all the APIs, which came fairly satisfactory on the, I guess Pavan can share more detail on the REST API side. All those uh, we have tested, most of them were working fine without any issues. So on the scaling and performance side, if I'm to measure or refer with reference to the potential web app, concurrent users in the application. This is okay, up to 10,000 we have tested. And for the mobile app, it's a work in progress. Good. So Tarshi, I'm sorry, I just want to clarify, you said that you're looking to scale the mobile app for 10 million users, yes. but the web app for 10,000. Yes. It, are you only expecting 10,000 customers to be scanning the QR code, but many more people to be? Oh. No, no, I would like to differentiate here. The web app mostly is being used for the enterprise grade application here, which is not the people in the company are going to use. Our design or philosophy of web app is for the B2B purpose, whereas the mobile app is for the grassroots level, all the people who belong to the co-ops and who are contributing to the value chain where there is a question on transparency, trust and visibility. So that's why we need more. Let's say if I take about a maybe one particular district in India, that might have more than a few thousand people, 10,000 farmers. Whereas if I talk about a business, I might have only a few users, 10, 20 users from there. So from a ratio that perspective, makes, we saw one is 2,000 here. That makes much more sense. Thank you so much for clarifying. My pleasure.
And, and along that lines, both Alicia's question as well as Jim's question, uh, I, and Jim, I don't know where you're, where you're going. I, one of the challenges that folks have had or that we've heard is not so much the blockchain architecture necessarily. It's more a matter of the, how do you, how do you get the data right from either sensors or your scanning uh, when it's at the point where it comes out of the fish farm or whether it gets loaded onto a truck or some of those kind of things. So maybe can you talk a little bit about how that actually happens? You mentioned sensors when you were when you were presenting. So I don't know if everything is instrumented with sensors or if that's more of a along the path somewhere from the farm and once it gets to some sort of packing center and then from the packing center, now I can have a sensor to make sure that's refrigerated with intolerances there. So if you can talk a little bit so, to that, that kind of scale. So Tom, can I add to your question? Tom, can I add to your question on that? You so having built can, sensor yeah. applications, yeah, having built sensor applications. Tom, what it I is, think you've frozen. Yeah, all the sensors. She's of Toshi Tom, you froze. I don't know if, if everyone else could hear you for a moment. Okay, I froze. Okay, I, I did you everyone hear me? Well, Jim, you heard me, right? Yeah, I did. So the okay, the, Tarsi, the, did you hear me the question you? on the sensors, though, oh. what it is is you have this sensor devices, but then the devices really all all manufacturers of sensor devices provide. I'll call it a software interface to the sensor, and then they give you usually an SDK for that. So usually you're aligning on sometimes even standards based, sometimes not, sometimes proprietary based SDKs that connect to the sensors. And that's really where the interface is going to be developed, if you will. Uh, I would like to, uh, you know, share some interesting story here. So Fishmonger itself has been the player who has helped in the market linkage in the Indian subcontinent. And they have been one of the pioneers inventing they have certain patents, I guess, eight to 10 patents, which are exclusively on the sensors. How do you transport uh, live fishes 1,500 kilometers via trucks is something they have figured out, and they are looking to scale it even more. And uh, that's the interesting part. So when it comes to the sensors, to keep the fishes alive in the while in transit or to measure certain other physical environmental attributes, they do have many patents on that starting from the aquaculture practice of the ponds where the fishes are being captured, the water quality parameters are tested. So this is something that they do. What we do is uh, taking those data in a blockchain for records, auditability and compliance. And when a government official might ask that, okay, you have been using a particular scheme, now do show like, uh, how do I validate? How do I prove that such practices have been actually implemented on the ground and it's not just a theoretical talk? So that's where the scope of blockchain comes as a potential use case to securely share this private and permission data, not with all, but with certain uh, segments who are interested and who are going to contribute or add value to the overall activity of the ecosystem. So that's what we do. Now, coming back to the Paramount practices, Paramount has been active in the mobility side of the overall supply chain here in the logistics as well where we are using GPS trackers, where the truck is going, what is the route, how it is being moving on, what speed, pace, and other uh, parameters, as well as if it's kept in a warehouse, what is the temperature, sharing some alerts using a particular dashboard analytics, then going ahead further in the value chain. So right from the, I would say, beginning, where Fishmonger using its own patented device and technology, and then blending and integrating with us in different areas as and when things progress, we amalgate ourselves pretty well. And that's how we are strategically positioned as uh, one of the strong contenders, I would say, moving forward in this live fish supply chain uh, innovation in the Indian subcontinent. The next element I would also like to add further is even before technology comes to play its role, like you want to use some sensors, you want to test and get some data, uh, you rely on many operators on the field. Some of those you can do at the beginning, but when you want to scale, you depend on operators. So awareness campaign, training, and uh, aligning all those stakeholders who are actually going to do the job on a day-to-day -day basis with you is important. That's where certain marketing 
activities that we are using or we are running right now looks to be beneficial. So even before going into the technical domain, I see that the market linkage and connecting and aligning the operators is critical. And then going into phase-wise rollout of the different tech stacks as is required. Good. That, that sounds good. Thank you. Uh, let's see. La last question from Jim Sequence here. Jim, you can go back with more questions or others can as, as well. What are the governance services and policy configure policies configurations users have to on F2P or farm to play processes as payments? So basically it sounds like it's kind of a governance statement. How, how configure how how configurable is it for people like yourself, Suvo, or others out there, you know, because it's a fairly diverse audience, as you point out there, Subtarshi, right? Who are going to be these operators as you're talking, calling them. Uh, maybe I'll leave uh, Pavan to respond to this question, if you wish, and then I can interject and add later. Yeah, okay. So primarily on the uh, access level, if I'm not wrong, so this question is on the access level. So whenever we configure any kind of user, they, it could be an agent or it could be organization admin, organization, some normal user. So we have a special model for ac granting access for uh, certain users. So it's totally up to the organization's uh, main user, the admin user, I would say. He can just provide, create a user and provide some certain access. Okay, this user will be accessing this feature of this mobile. Okay, he can just create activity, record the activity, not more than that. So that can be configured granularly. Uh, so while creating the user itself, at any point of time, that role can be uh, reconfigured or updated as per the requirement uh, by the, um, uh, uh, main users, I would say, admin users. So it's totally configurable. Yes, yeah, would you like to add something? Uh, yes, you are right. If we are referring to this particular part, I guess you gave a brief update on the IDEM practices, if I'm not wrong, somewhat connecting to that. Did I get it correct on the RBEC and IDEM on the general usage of the user access? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. That was my takeaway. And I, I guess, um, is, is it configurable what's, uh, to go along with the policies? Is, is there certain, can, is it user changeable to change what actually is stored on a blockchain, for instance? That might be one example of, of something. So, so I would like to say there are two levels of access I may talk about. First is from the blockchain architecture or blockchain design, the network design, where we give access to different stakeholders in the network. Initially, we started off with giving equal access as a democratized, uh, fully decentralized kind of in uh, philosophy of blockchain. And then we figured out it's not working out. <laughs> and nobody's willing to pay. Affordability becomes a big concern. Technic tech savvy or being able to operate becomes another concern. So that's how our engagement got delayed for quite a long time. Then we have to curate to the IBM model where they had come up with a intermediary where you do have a blockchain network, I would use rather the word distributed ledger, but with a flavor where one person becomes a primary uh, stakeholder to onboard all others in the ecosystem or in the network. That's where fishmongers come being the primary stakeholder to influence and onboard the different processors, the different distributors, retailers, suppliers, and everyone else. So that did work. So this is what I can share. Uh, coming back to the general usage, we have started initially with an RBEC-based policy, which is role-based access control for users. However, right now, depending on the use case, we are seeing that an ABAC or attribute-based access control is getting more uh, expectations or kind of becoming a need for operations, especially those who are working 24 by 7 in the warehouses, because they need to be physically present in the warehouse. They need to use a certain designated laptop with a certain software and it cannot be just randomly anybody using all around the world. So they are not working remote. They have to be in person physically. They are handling physical supply chain. So that's where we see that uh, we are pivoting a little bit closer towards the ABAC uh, philosophy on the user level access control. And uh, outside that on the Hyperledger fabric based trust, I guess Pawan can share how do we manage those root certificates and else. I guess this covers the entire scope of the policies, governance, and uh, uh, other attributes. 
as may be required. But I'll request Jim, uh, is there any other aspect or did we somehow get closer to what you are trying to get? Actually, you covered it all. And I think the one thing I'll say is you, you mentioned you're moving to version 2.5 of Fabric. And mm -hmm. one of the things that Fabric itself has changed is the idea that they make it easier for organizations to administer their own user community, if you will. So if you go back to Fishmongers, the way it's set up right now, as you said, <clears throat> they're, I'll call it a primary um, party on the network, on your network. And they would onboard their own community as you said, as an intermediary. And then this model of 2.5, the way they do it with, I'll call it better uh, decentralized management allows a, a group like Fishmongers to do much better, full control, I should say, on uh, how they bring their own community on board to your network, which actually should be a pretty good advantage for you at some point. Good. Thank you, Jim. Any other final questions here before we wrap up? I'll give a going once, going twice, going three times, sold. So thank you, uh, Saptarshi. Thank you, Suvos. Thank you, Pavan, for uh, sharing Farm to Plate and what you're doing with fishmongers and uh, how, how you've, you, you came through the process of learning what worked and what didn't work. And hopefully those are the kind of learnings and experiences that will help others who are watching this so that they don't have to go through some of those challenges and can end up at a good state like you are at this point in time. So with that, I'm going to close. I, as I mentioned earlier on, we will uh, take this recording, we'll get it up on YouTube, hopefully here fairly uh, shortly, uh, probably within 24 hours or so. And then we'll put something out on the uh, wiki to let you know that it's posted and you can share that with all, all of your friends out there in the world that need to hear more about what's going on here with uh, Farm to Plate. So with that, thanks everybody for uh, joining. Have a great rest of your day, whether it's a shorter day if you're in India or a longer day if you're in the United States or you're in like Hawaii or something like that where you really got a long day left. So with that, we'll see you all next time. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, guys.